Oh, hello. So uh, welcome to the um, David Sheraton School of Computer Science Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, my name is Justin Wen. I'm a um, faculty member in uh, CS here, and I'm also the host uh, for today's um, talk. Um, today we're happy to have Professor Jim Demol from Berkeley to give us uh, the presentation. Um, so here I'm going to do a, just a brief introduction of Jim. So um, Jim got um, finished his undergraduate at Caltech and then uh, um, got his PhD at uh, Univers UC Berkeley uh, in 1983. And, um, and then afterwards, okay, um, finally moved back to um, Berkeley and becomes um, a professor in computer science. Right now he is the uh, Dr. Richard Carl Day Mull Distinguished Professor at UC Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> Slightly different spelling, yes. And in the meantime, he's also the um, um, division chair of computer science um, at the um, EDCS. Uh, well, he has a long, beautiful academic record, so I'm trying to just <laughs> cut it down to <laughs> 10 lines, okay, but still quite impressive um, uh, honors and awards. So uh, Jim is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, so which is equivalent to our Royal Society. And also, he, uh, Jim is um, ASEM Fellow, IEEE Fellow, SIEM Fellow, AMS, uh, AMS Fellow, and AAS Fellow. I think you got all the fellows and <laughs> the, uh, all the professional uh, societies. And in addition, okay, he has received a number of uh, awards in his uh, research. For example, the ACM Paris Canal Lackey's Theory and Practice Award, APDPS Charles Babbage Award, SIAG on Linear Al Algebra Pay uh, Prize, uh, Sydney from, uh, from Bach Award, and so on. Okay, so there's a, just too long the list. Okay, I can uh, mention it all. Uh, but to most people, okay, what Jim is well known about is really his a few distinguished work. So the number one work that I know about, ah, uh, Jim Demmel is uh, his work uh, involved in the LA pack, you know, package, a package that used worldwide okay, for solving uh, Linux system. Most computers in the world actually has LA pack installed uh, that people use. Um, so this is uh, one of the uh, early achievements, and then later on, this is another wonderful achievement of Jim. Okay, is uh, numerical uh, linear algebra. So this is a book that used uh, worldwide, including um, here in Waterloo. Okay, we use this textbook for our uh, course, fourth year course. And um, in the meantime, maybe I should mention my uh, personal. Uh, experience with uh, Jim, so I met Jim in many conferences, but I'm not sure whether Jim knows that okay, uh, our first encounter is actually a long time ago. So the first time I met Jim, okay, I heard about the name, you know, since the beginning of my graduate study. So the first time I met Jim Demmel was in um, San Francisco. Yeah, so during the uh, uh, NSF um, Regional Conference in the Mathematical Sciences, Numerical Linear Algebra on Parallel Processors. So there's a workshop, okay? And Jim Demmer was the principal um, lecturer for, for the workshop, okay? I was a graduate student at the time, so it was 1995, and I still keep the notes that uh, I got, okay, from the workshop, okay, because I, I love it, okay? It's really, really um, good notes for parallel computing and uh, linear algebra. And, um, and in fact, today, um, Jim will give us a talk on this topic and more modern new development uh, in that um, area. So uh, uh, today he's going to talk about uh, communication avoiding algorithms for linear algebra and beyond. So let's uh, uh, welcome uh, Professor Jim Demo. Yep. Okay, now it works. So I was reminiscing with Alan George when I first walked in that the last time I was in Waterloo was at the Householder Meeting on Numerical Linear Algebra in 1984. So I'm pleased to be back to give you talk about the same subject, Numerical Linear Algebra, with, with some updates, I promise. <laughs> 
So I'm going to tell you about communication avoiding algorithms for linear algebra and beyond. But before I can tell you why we should avoid communication, I have to tell you what communication is. And so my model that I'm going to use for algorithms to assess their cost and prove whether they're optimal or not is to count two things, the amount of arithmetic they do, flops, floating point operations, and also communication, which means moving data. And that could mean between different uh, pro uh, different levels of a memory hierarchy between DRAM and cache or between different processors over a network. So why do I care about that? So here's going to be my model I'm going to use for performance. I'm going to count the number of flops. I'm going to count the number of words moved over any of those wires on, this, on that picture. And I'm going to count the number of messages. What's a message? It's a bunch of contiguous words packed together and sent all at once. And then, so those all depend on your algorithm. And then, these numbers all depend on your computer. The time to do a floating point operation, the time to send a word, and the time to send a message over the network. And those last two are what we call communication. And the reason I care about the last two is because of hardware trends that says the time per flop is orders of magnitude less than the time to send one word. And that, in turn, can be orders of magnitude less than the time for a, pa a packet of words to get across the network. And in fact, these gaps are growing exponentially. So here's some rather old data, but you know, the, the more recent data confirms it. So these are the annual performance improvements, so everything's getting better for all of these different things. Flops, you know, back in the days of Moore's Law, which has ended, of course, was getting better at 60% a year. And bandwidth and latency too, were too, but much, much more slowly. So what this means is that even if your algorithm is not communication limited today, it may be next year or the year after that. So we want to avoid communication to save time. But that's not the only reason. We also want, we're worried about the energy that it takes to run a program. So here is a plot, a log scale, the number of picojoules, so the energy it takes to do a double precision floating point operation, to move data into a register, to move it one millimeter on a chip, five millimeters, and then how much it takes to move it off chip. So to the DRAM over a local interconnect or across the whole system. The blue bars are, let's say, it says now, but this is like 2014 data. And then the red is an estimate of what it'll be next year, which is up to an order of magnitude less. So everything is getting more efficient. But if I look at this, it's one and a half orders of magnitude more expensive per operation to communicate now. And it'll be about two and a half orders of uh, magnitude of communication cost and energy more to communicate uh, in 2018. So whether you're concerned about the battery in your cell phone dying, or the million dollars per megawatt per year that it costs to run your data center, or how long you can keep your drone in the air, it depends on your funding agency, then you should be worried about energy. So we want to mi minimize communication to save energy. So here are the goals. I want to redesign algorithms to avoid communication. And that means across all those wires, between all the levels of the memory hierarchy, between different processors over a network, and I would like to prove lower bounds. I would like to know whether the, the algorithms that either exist today or that we could possibly invent attain lower bounds on the communication. So the way we began this is we proved some lower bounds, which I'll tell you about, and we compared them to the existing algorithms in libraries like LAPAC and ScalePAC, and we did asymptotically more communication than necessary. And so we've been very busy over the last few years reinventing all the basic algorithms. And so just to give you some eye candy, here's some speed ups that we've gotten on some of the basic algorithms. I won't have time to talk about all of them. Up to 12x faster for matrix multiply. This is the classical n cube matrix multiply on a 64,000 core IBM BGP. So it was surprising that a factor of 12 was left on the floor on this very well studied algorithm. Three times faster for tensor contractions. Six times faster for all pairs shortest path. Now that's a graph theory algorithm, but if you look at it, it's, it's three nested loops. It still smells like matrix multiply. Uh, two and a half, 2.1 times faster for uh, Gaussian elimination. I'll tell you what these acronyms mean, 2.5D. It has to do with how the data is allocated. 11 times faster for the direct end body problem. 13 times faster for doing the QR decomposition of a tall skinny matrix, so for least squares problems. Um, 6.7 times faster for the symmetric eigenvalue problem on a 
narrow band matrix. Um, all these ideas apply to algorithms like Strassen, which are asymptotically faster ways to do matrix multiply. So this is all direct methods. It also works using a, a different set of ideas for iterative linear algebra. And so if you look at the mini GMG, that's geometric multigrid benchmark, that's a standard iterative solver, then the bottleneck turns out to be an iterative solver, which is called uh, conjugate gradient stabilized. And we made that go much, much faster. And in real applications like combustion simulation, we also get big speed ups. And we've recently, because my students really want to work on machine learning, of course, um, We've been applying these ideas to new machine learning algorithms. And if you look at coordinate descent lasso, which is very much a nonlinear algorithm, it's L1 regression, we also get big speed ups by using the same set of ideas. So just to mention a few uh, bits of impact, the tall skinny QR you know, got the uh, SIAG supercomputing best paper prize last year and was, we finally got it out into LAPAC. And the ideas of the matrix multiply were adopted by a startup uh, called Nirvana, which was acquired by Intel last August. So here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to survey the state of the art in communication avoiding algorithms. And I'll review classical matrix multiply, which I hope is familiar and the, and the naive way to do it and the best way to do it. I'll say how we got that factor of 12 speed up by doing it in a, in a, you know, a, a different way. And then I'll talk about the tall skinny QR algorithm for uh, doing least squares. Then I'll explain very briefly how this extends not just to linear algebra, but to any algorithm that you can think of as nested loops accessing arrays with pretty much general subscripts. And it turns out that all of these ideas can be extended to that very general class of code. And it relies on this recent result in pure mathematics that involves graph theory, uh, group theory and functional analysis that was a contribution of uh, Terry Tao and some other pure mathematicians a few years ago. And so yeah, I'll mention that very briefly. And then, uh, in the second hour of my talk, I'll finally get to communication avoiding Krilov subspace method, so applying ideas to make you know, things like conjugate gradient go faster. So let's do this survey first. So here is a summary of communication avoiding linear algebra. Let me start with direct methods. So we have lower bounds on the communication for anything that is linear algebra, so solving AX equal B, least squares problems, eigenvalue problems, the SVD. And as I mentioned before, we compared these to algorithms, standard algorithms, and we, they mostly did not attain the lower bounds. They mostly did asymptotically more than necessary. And so we've been uh, adding new algorithms to all these libraries, which is a lot of software engineering. It takes a lot longer than just doing the theory, it turns out. And so we're working on incorporating these into the libraries like LAPAC and Plasma and Magma. And you'll see that they're large speed ups possible. I should say what the theory does is it gives you a design space. It doesn't tell you exactly all the many block sizes and other parameters you have to choose inside the code. And so we often use auto-tuning to sort of search the design space to pick the optimal sizes. So that's a summary of direct linear algebra. And let me just say ditto for iterative linear algebra. So let me tell you what the lower bound is for linear algebra. So imagine that you have uh, two levels of memory, DRAM, slow memory, and cache, fast memory. And the fast memory of, is of size capital M. And so the, the, what I want to know is, suppose I want to run matrix multiply, and the thing I want to have a bound on is how much data has to move back and forth between the slow memory and the fast memory. Because I'm only allowed to do arithmetic to do real work on the data in cache. And so here's for anything that smells like three nested loops. And I'll have a careful mathematical definition of smells like later, but your intuition is fine for now. Then the number of, of words that have to move over that wire between DRAM and cache is lower bounded by however many flops that processor is assigned to do divided by the square root of the fast memory size. So and it doesn't matter what the work is. This is the lower bound. Now, in the parallel, now I say per processor. So in the parallel case, assume you have, you know, your problem is load balance. So you've assigned each processor one pth if they're p processors of all the work to do. So that's what would go in the numerator. So we've known for decades, 1984, in a paper by Hong and Kung, that this holds for matrix multiply in the case of a sequential algorithm, just two levels of memory hierarchy. But now we know it holds for just about everything. It holds for all the basic linear algebra subroutines, for LU, QR, eigenvalue, SVD, tensor contractions, which of course you know, have many more subscripts, but it's the same idea. 
uh, it sometimes it holds for whole programs. It's not just like one call to one of these subroutines. You could have, for example, suppose I'm computing a power of a matrix. I call matrix multiply over and over again. No matter how I organize all those different matrix multiplies and interleave them in arbitrary ways, it's the same lower bound. It applies not just to dense linear algebra, it applies to sparse linear algebra. So this numerator doesn't have to be n cubed, it can be however many operations you do on your particular sparse matrix, which of course is going to depend on the sparsity structure. Uh, it applies in both the sequential and parallel case, and it applies to some graph theoretic algorithms, that was the all pairs shortest path algorithm, because I don't really care what you do in the inner loop, I just care which data you access. So if you do multiplies and adds, linear algebra, if you're doing maxes and pluses, graph theory, that's okay. So that's the lower bound on the number of words moved, but I also want to bound on the latency, because that's even more expensive, the number of messages. So how many messages do I absolutely have to send? Here's the simplest lower bound. Imagine I take all my words and I pack them, each of them, into the largest possible message. That would minimize the number of messages. What's the largest possible message size? It's the whole memory, right? Capital M. So that tells me that the number of words sent is a factor of M smaller than this one, in the best possible case. So sometimes I can attain that, sometimes I can't, but that's sort of the most natural lower bound. And I'm pleased to say all this won another best paper prize. Okay. So, can I attain these lower bounds? As I, I've said before, LA pack and scale pack don't. So, what do the new algorithms look like? Um, we need, when I say new algorithms, I don't mean just reorganizing the loops and doing things in a different order. We have to do that too. But we need new algorithms with new numerical properties. They may converge differently. They may represent the output in a different data format. And you know, there are different ways to encode orthogonal matrices. All of that had to change. Now, in the case of sparse matrices, um, this is harder. We need some structure on the sparse matrix in order to do something. So imagine you're multiplying two diagonal matrices. There's no magic there. You can't reuse data. The naive algorithm is optimal. So we can prove, for example, if you're doing a matrix multiply of random sparse matrices, there's some structure there. We can prove lower bounds. If you have uh, you know, finite element matrices and you're doing sparse Kolesky, there's enough structure there. If you have good separators, we can apply the lower bounds in that case. And I'd like to just mention one other one that came up recently uh, in computational biology, um, and this is work of uh, some other folks in our group. If you do sparse times dense matrix multiply, which comes up in, uh, let's see, what were the applications again? Um, it's inverse covariance matrix estimation in MRI and genomics, then they got the same ideas and they got 100-fold speed ups. Okay, so again, this is all advertising. Now let's actually look at an algorithm. So let me re review classical matrix multiply and how we optimize it. So here I have three nested loops over i, j, and k, and the inner loop is just doing the dot product down here of the ith row of a and the jth column of b and putting the answer in c sub i, j. So let me, so that's the simple code. Now let me annotate it to say where the data moves because that's what I want to count. So I'm just going to insert some comments on when the data might move in a reason, by, a, you know, by a reasonable cache. So I begin by reading the ith row of A into fast memory, and I'm going to keep it there until I'm done using it. Can't do better than that. Then I'll read the, that entry of C. Then I read that column of B, and then I do a dot product. And I completely compute that entry, and I write it back to memory. So that is intuitively the best you can do. And let me just do the counting. So I'm going to read each row of A once and keep it there. So I'm just going to do n squared reads all together. That's the size of A. That's the lower bound. Again, I will read each entry of C once and write it once. Can't do better than that. But I'm going to read each column of B n times. Because the idea here is I can't fit all of B into cache. So you know, it has to keep getting flushed. And so when I add it all together, I've done order n cubed reads and writes, which completely dominates the 2n cubed arithmetic. So what is the classic, well-known way of uh, improving this? I'm going to do something called blocking. So I'm going to take my matrices and think of them as breaking up into B by B blocks. So each of these little squares is now a B by B block. I'll again have three nested loops, but I'm looping over the blocks. And what do I do? I'm going to read in that block of A, that B by B block of A, that B by B block of B. And then I'm going to do a B by B matrix multiply that fits entirely in cache and update that B by B block of C. And so, let me just again, and let me assume that all these three B by B blocks fit in cache. So I have to pick B small enough so those three blocks fit in cache. And so there's no more memory traffic for this 
line of code, which is actually three more nested loops. It's a B by B matrix multiply. So now, when I do all of the accounting to add up how much data moves, I'm doing a factor of B less communication. So I now have a, a serious improvement if I pick B large enough. I'm, I've improved the, the cost by a factor of B. Okay, so let's ask, is this good enough to attain the lower bound? So let me just recall what I said was, if I pick B of a size that I can fit three B by B blocks into fast memory, then the total number of reads and writes is order N cubed over B. So obviously I want to make B as large as possible, but subject to this constraint that everything fits in memory, so 3B squared, my three matrices have to fit in memory, and so I can't do better in this approach than N cubed over the square root of M. And that's the lower bound. That's the number of flops divided by the square root of M. And so this has been known for a very long time, but notice that I'm assuming I know what my hardware looks like, right? I assume I know capital M. What if you don't? Well, there actually is a way to deal with that. And it's something called cache oblivious. So you just write recursively, break up my n by n matrices into matrices of half the size, multiply them, uh, do that recursively, and it all attains the lower bound. So that's, again, this is just review. That's the sequential case, hits the lower bound. Here is the parallel case, which has also been around for a long time. And this sort of hits the lower bound. So this is the right algorithm to use if you only have enough memory to fit one copy of your data. So now, in this picture, uh, uh, what this picture is, is suppose I have 16 processors and they're arranged in a 4x4 four four grid. So what this picture means is that's a processor, that's a processor, and so forth, but each processor owns a submatrix. So this is a picture of the matrices and a picture of the processors. And so what's the algorithm going to do? It's just going to do an outer product. It's going to take that block column, red block column of A, multiply it by that blue block row of B, and update the matrix. It's just going to you know, loop over all possible red columns and blue rows. And so what, what is the communication here? Well, this processor that owns that red block column is going to broadcast it to all its neighbors in the same processor row. So these arrows say, please broadcast that sideways, so everybody gets a copy. Then everybody who owns a block row broadcasts it to their column. So everybody in this column gets a copy. That means that every processor is going to get a red submatrix from its neighbor in its row, a blue submatrix in the neighbor in its column, it's going to receive them and update its local copy of C. And all of that's going to happen in parallel. And I, the code is there, but that's sort of the basic simple intuition. And so the question is, is this algorithm good enough? So let me just sit, ask, does it hit the lower bound? So I'm going to assume now in more generality, I have n by n matrices. They're spread over p processors. That means that each processor is going to own about one piece of the data, so order n squared over p. So what do my lower bounds look like? Well, it's the number of flops that each processor does, which is one piece of the total, divided by the square root of m. And, in, and that turns into n squared over root p, and indeed, that algorithm hits that lower bound. And the number of messages is a factor of m smaller, and if you do the algebra, it's just the square root of p. So it doesn't depend on your matrix size, it just depends on how many processors you have. So that's the lower bound for that algorithm and for all of dense linear algebra. And so as I said, we went and looked at Scalapack, the parallel algorithm, and we asked ourselves, do you hit the lower bounds? And for the number of words moved for the bandwidth, it mostly did, except for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. On the other hand, for the messages, they were all asymptotically worse, except for Koleski. We did vastly more than the square root of p. And so the first thing we did was we said, okay, let's fix this. Let me invent new algorithms for this stuff that hits this lower bound in, this, in the sense that we minimize the number of messages. And we got some good speed ups that way. And, that's, and we, we thought we were done for a moment. And then we asked, can we do better? Can we do better than hitting this particular lower bound? And so aren't we already optimal? Why, did I, why am I even asking the question? That's because I made this assumption that I'm using as little memory as possible. Remember, an M is in the denominator, so the, and, and the lower bounds still work if you use more memory than you need, so than you think you need. And so the, question, so the question is, if I use more memory, can I still hit the lower bound? And it turns out there was a special case in the literature that's been re reinvented many times. It's called three-dimensional matrix multiply. And I'll have a picture on the next slide. And, but it assumes that you have this magic amount of memory. It's not, n cubed, it's not n squared over p per processor. It's n squared over p to the two-thirds. And, and you know, if p is large, you, you may not have that much memory, right? So it's sort of a very special case. And so you don't always have p to the one-third times as much memory available. 
So let me tell you what we can do for any amount of memory that you may have available. And we instead of calling this, so the original algorithm, this is naturally called two-dimensional matrix multiply because it's a two-dimensional grid of processors. This was three-dimensional matrix multiply. So our new algorithm, what else do we call it? Two and a half dimensional matrix multiply. So it sort of interpolates between those two. So here's the idea. Assume that I have enough memory to fit C copies of the data. And C could be anywhere from one up to whatever you want. Depends how much, how much hardware you have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrange all my P processors into this grid where I have C levels. Each level is going to get a, its own copy of the data, and each layer has one seeth of all the processors. So, so in this case, if I have two copies, I'll have 16 processors in each level. So let me now, just to explain the algorithm at a very high level, index all of these processors by i, j, and k. And I'll assume that initially, when I get started, all the matrices are just laid out in the top level. So that you know, n over 4 by n over 4 submatrix processor owns you know, that submatrix of a, b, and c. So what does the algorithm do? Three steps. I start by taking all the data here that I own, submatrices of A, B, and C, and broadcasting them so every layer has a copy. So that's where I'm using the extra memory. Every layer has a copy. Then each layer performs one seeth of the algorithm. It computes, in this case, one half of all the partial sums that I need to do to do matrix multiply. Then when I'm done, I have to, all those partial sums are sitting right on top of one another in the same column. And then I just do a reduction, a, a sum reduction vertically, and the answer ap appears magically at the top. So is this worth doing? So here's some speed ups. 12x, for, uh, so, uh, for example. So this is for an 8,000 by 8,000 matrix multiply. This is for a much larger matrix multiply. And this is on a 64,000 core machine. And, and it may seem silly to waste 64,000 cores to do an 8K by 8K multiply. And in fact, so the vertical axis is percent of machine peak, so the top is 100%. If we use the classical algorithm, 2D, one copy of the data, that's blue, we're running at 2% of peak. It's clearly a waste of all these resources. But if we use exactly the right number of copies of the data, in this case 16 was the right one, we went 12 times faster, and we're running at about 25% of peak. If I look at the much larger problem, I get a 2.7X speed up. Uh, but I'm getting, you know, like 80% of peak. So let me do, let me show you the same data now, but just broken down so we know where the time actually went. So this is the same data broken down to where the time went. And so this is the uh, 8K by 8K matrix, the, you know, 128K by 128K. And so when I just have one copy of the data, nine, so red is communication, sending messages, blue is idle time, just waiting for those messages to show up, and green is arithmetic, it's the flop time. And you can see that the, there was a 95% reduction in the communication. The red shrank down, the idle time shrank down, and even the flop time shrank. So, so how could that be? Because I'm doing the same arithmetic. And the answer is that when I call, do the local matrix multiplies with a new algorithm, they're on larger submatrices. And so the, so the blahs, the local matrix multiply, runs faster because it uses the local memory hierarchy better. And so even that went faster. So altogether that was 12x. And in the um, other case, where I, for the much larger matrix, you can see a third of the time was already in arithmetic. That didn't go any faster. But I still got rid of like 95% of the communication. So if that's where all your energy is going, then I still may have saved you 95% of the energy. And I'm pleased to say this won another distinguished paper prize. And this was the algorithm that was adopted by the startup that was acquired by uh, Intel. So I'd like to say that this idea does something I'm going to call perfect strong scaling in time and energy. So what does scaling mean? Scaling means I want to double the number of processors and in some sense do twice as well. So let's see what that means. So every time I add a processor, you know, I'm getting a, you know, more CPU. I'm getting twice as much CPU, but I'm also getting more memory, right? You paid for it. You might as well use it. So when I say scaling, I want to use all the hardware resources that arrive when I add processors. So let me start do a little algebra. Let me assume I start with the fewest number of processors available. P processors, each has memory M, and it's just barely big enough to fit my three N by N matrices. So now I want to ask, suppose I increase the number of processors by a factor of C. I'm going to increase the total memory by a factor of C. Let me use it all in that algorithm and see what happens. So I'm going to write down a little performance model. I'm going to count the number of seconds per flop, the seconds per word moved, 
and the seconds per message of size m to move it across the network. And I can write down a little formula. The time it takes to do n by n matrix multiply on c times p processors is this messy formula. I don't want you to pay attention to the details. I just want you to pay attention to how it scales. It scales perfectly. It's exactly c times faster. That means the arithmetic time has gone down by a factor of c, the bandwidth cost has down by, gone down by a factor of c, and the latency cost has gone down by a factor of c. So that's what I call perfect strong scaling in time. So what about energy? I need an energy model here. So again, I'm just going to count joules for everything that's going on. So I have the joules per flop, the joules per word moved, the joules per message, but there's a lot of other places that burn energy in your computer. In particular, the memory burns a lot of energy. So let me count that. I'll count the number of joules per word of memory used per second, so just to you know, keep the memory turned on. And then you know, there's the leakage, the network, all that other stuff just burning energy continuously. That's just proportional to time. So now I can write down another model, and it's even messier than it was before. This is the energy to do matrix multiply on C times P processors. All I care about is how it scales. It scales perfectly. It doesn't take any more energy to solve the problem C times faster. So how could that be? So here's the way to think about it. I have C times as many processors. Each one is burning power at the same rate. You know, the hardware hasn't changed. And each one is turned on for one Cth as long. So the Cs cancel, and it's the same total energy cost. So I call this perfect strong scaling in energy. And it extends to n-body and Strassen and lots of other algorithms. I'm just showing it to you for matrix multiply. Yes? Were you able to verify that your energy really scales, scales experimentally? So we, I had this collaboration with a bunch of hardware. Yeah, question? The, the question was, do I have experimental evidence to verify the, um, the, what we... Uh, predicted here theoretically about the energy, and I had a student who spent a summer at Intel, you know, behind the, uh, you know, the fence, so to speak, you know, trying to measure this stuff, and it's very hard to get accurate measurements, you know, from real hardware. I also had a bunch of colleagues at Berkeley who were trying to build their own special purpose low-level modeling tools. That's an ongoing project, so it, it is hard to tell, but this suggests that you know, you know, it should be much more efficient uh, energy-wise, and if you, you know, if I'm missing any terms, None of the hardware people have told me yet. So. <laughs> and so, so you may also say, speaking of hardware, you know, is this realistic in the sense that am I assuming that my network is magical and every processor can talk to every other processor simultaneously and you know, something unrealistic like that? And the answer is no. We can also prove lower bounds on what the network has to look like. And it turns out for this, all you need is a three-dimensional torus, which is a very common hardware network. You need to talk to your neighbors in three dimensions, and then this, all you have to do is talk to nearest neighbors to get this, this algorithm to work. So we can also deal with hardware topologies. OK, so that's the end of the matrix multiply. And I now want to go on to a, a different flavored algorithm, which is tall, skinny QR. So let me. Uh, talk about this. So I want to take my matrix W and factor it into Q times R, orthogonal times upper triangular. And so let me uh, imagine I have four processors, and each processor owns one-fourth of the matrix uh, divided up this way. So each processor owns n over four rows. So the way the algorithm is going to work is that the first step, every algorithm is going to independently do a QR decomposition locally, no communication, and do four QRs. Let me now observe that what I've computed is the following factorization. This block diagonal orthogonal matrix of Qs times a stack of four triangles. So that's the first step of the algorithm. It's not QR yet, but I'm, I'm getting close. Then I'm going to take this stack of four triangles, pair them up. There's some communication there. And for every pair of triangles, I will do its QR decomposition. And then let me notice that what I've done is I've implicitly computed the, the product of this block diagonal orthogonal matrix times two triangles, half as many triangles as before. Last step of the algorithm, take the last two triangles and do QR. So what have I computed? This is the QR decomposition. I have factored my matrix W as the product of that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times R. That still is the QR decomposition. It's just a different representation of it. Okay, and I did it with one reduction operation. So if you like, one call to MPI reduce with QR as the operation. So let me just draw that picture to make it obvious that I'm just doing a reduction operation uh, in, on a binary tree, and every one of these reductions just stacks these two guys on top of one another and does QR, and, and, you know, and I save the data in between. So that's the parallel algorithm. 
But I would like also to optimize communication in a sequential machine. And that means I, my matrix is so big it doesn't fit in cache, and I can only fit, say, a quarter of it into cache at, at one time. So actually, it's the same algorithm. I just use a different shape tree. And so here's the optimal sequential algorithm. I'll read in the, the, the top quarter of the matrix into cache, do QR. Read in the next quarter of the matrix, put that triangle on top of that rectangle, do QR. Read in the next rectangle, do QR. Read in the next rectangle. And I've read the matrix from slow memory to fast memory once, and I've done QR. So in one is a lower bound. So what if I have a different architecture, a dual core machine? I may have some sort of reduction tree that looks like that, that uses both processors at once, and also minimizes the off-chip traffic. Off -chip traffic. But you know, what if I have a real machine? You know, it's multi-core and multi-socket and multi-rack and out of core and all of that. I'm just going to choose the reduction tree dynamically. So depending on what hardware resources I may have at runtime, I can choose that tree to use them optimally. That means that the data structure will depend on what hardware resources I have. But it's still a QR decomposition. I just have to make sure I do the software engineering carefully so that it's reusable from time to time. So what kind of speed ups have I gotten? So there was an 8x speed up on an Intel Cloverton you know, on using eight cores. On a, some of this data is old. Uh, sorry about that. Pentium 3 cluster, 6.7x speed up. Uh, a blue gene just on 32 processors on a very tall and skinny matrix, 4x speed up. Uh, the GPU, uh, that was a 13x speed up. This was an interesting one. This was four computers over f in four French cities connected over the internet. And so in this case, it went exactly four times uh, faster on four cities versus one city. So in there, obviously, the latency over the internet was, was the whole uh, cost of that one. And then there's cloud computing. So in this case, what is our metric of success? We just do one big map reduce on the entire matrix. And we say, all right, that's our lower bound. How much faster can we go than, or how much slower do we go than that? And it turns out that our algorithm is equivalent to two map reduces. And we were within a factor of 1.6 of that lower bound. So it works very well in the cloud computing environment as well. The best speed up we had was infinite. So how do we get an infinite speed up? I had a student doing the following experiment. Uh, he had a, a matrix on his laptop. It was so big, it, it didn't fit in memory at all. It had to fit on disk. And so when he ran the classical algorithm, it just thrashed the disks so much, he got tired of waiting and turned it off. And it, as opposed, but you know, it only went two times slower versus the predicted speed of infinite DRAM. So it almost made the disk completely invisible. So, uh, and I should say that if you have a tall, skinny matrix and you want to compute the singular value decomposition, this is the first step. That's where all the time is. You get the same speed ups. And uh, this won another best paper prize. Okay. So let me say there's lots and lots of related work that I won't have time to go into. We've you know, done lots of other algorithms. Uh, you know, so for pivoting, because you know, obviously for Gaussian elimination, you have to pivot to get the right answer. We have to abandon partial pivoting. There's a completely different pivoting scheme that we had to prove was numerically stable. Same ideas for QR decomposition if you're trying to do column subset selection, which is a big deal in data analysis. We have you know, various sparse matrix things going on. Um, so it turns out that for Gaussian elimination, when we do that trick of having extra copies, the bandwidth goes down, but we can't decrease the latency. There's, an, there's a new lower bound I didn't have time to tell you about that says that the latency times the bandwidth is a constant for Gaussian elimination. So if you make the bandwidth smaller by adding extra copies, the latency goes up. And so you have to tune that depending on the relative costs of bandwidth and latency on your machine. And it all applies to Strassen-like algorithms too. And so we can go the fastest, you know, fastest big matrix multiply in the world by using communication avoiding Strassen. So there are lots of different platforms on, the, on which this stuff applies, including heterogeneous machines. Um, and there are lots of different applications. So, uh, so if the, this is called the Cyclops tensor framework that does tensor contractions where you have symmetric tensors. And, the, and this is like the, you know, the bottleneck in all computational chemistry. And so one of my graduate students you know, built this, and it's widely used in computational chemistry. OK. So now, are there any questions about that before I go on to the uh, second part? I think I'm on schedule. So I now want to say how all of these ideas extend to arbitrary code that looks like nested loops accessing arrays. And so let me tell you how to generalize this. 
by, again, starting with matrix multiply and telling you what the generalization looked like. So there's the naive three nested loops for matrix multiply. And the blocked code that we had said, OK, I'm going to break up my matrix into B by B blocks. And I'll loop over those. And my inner loop will be a B by B matrix multiply. So just review. And what was my theorem? My theorem says that if I pick the block size the right way, the square root of m, square root of the cache size, then I can attain the lower bound, which is the number of flops divided by m to the 1 half. So the question is, where does this 1 half come from? How do I generalize that to arbitrary code? So let me just, to give you a, a, a flavor for it before I go into the hard math, take the theorem and just tell you what it says for matrix multiply. So here's what it says. All I have to do to analyze this code is build a little 3x3 three three matrix that records which arrays have which subscripts. That's all I need to know. So there's going to be one column for each array index, i, j, k, one row for each array, a, b, c, and all I do is record that a has subscripts i and k, so I have ones there, b has subscripts j and k, and so forth. Okay? Then, so that's all I need. The theory goes on to say, solve the following 3x3 three three linear program. Um, maximize the sum of these three numbers subject to the constraint that this matrix times these guys is less than or equal to 1. And the answer, it's a very easy linear program, is 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. And the value of the linear program is 3 halves. And I'm going to call it S sub HBL. HBL are the acronyms of three very famous mathematicians. And I, I can tell you their names in the, in the next couple of slides. So I do that very simple stuff. And the theorem says that no matter how I organize that code, the lower bound is number of flops divided by the cache size to this exponent minus 1, which is n cubed over m to the 1 half. And how do I attain it? I have to block it. And the block sizes are given by the, end of the solution to the linear program. So this you know, is, you know, generalizes to arbitrary code. So let me give you some idea of how that generalization looks. So again, uh, let me, you know, just give, to explain the notation, I'll start with matrix multiply. And I'm going to say that all I need to understand about these nested loops is that I'm iterating over some triples of integers, right? Every iteration of the inner loop is indexed by i, j, and k, some subset of triples of integers. And all I need to know is that I'm accessing locations given by these pairs of subscripts. So I just, you know, extract it out. I don't care what I'm doing with the data. I don't care how many lines of code I have. I'm just going to extract that. So what's the general case? Slightly more general case. I could have as many nested loops as I like. I mean, I could express this without loops. I could do it with a recursion or lots of different ways. I can have as many arrays as I like, as many lines of code. The subscripts can be arbitrary affine functions of the arrays. And I can have as many subscripts as I like. You know, some could have one, some could have three. And they don't have to actually be arrays. They can be arbitrary data structures. So here's a pointer. So the idea is that as I give you this linear function, and that gives me some unique location in some data structure where your data lives. That's, that's all I need for this to, to work. OK, and so how do I abstract that? I'm going to think of that as every, line, every iteration is indexed by some k tuple of integers in some subset, which could be dense or sparse. And all I need to do is remember the subscripts. And to give you a hint of the kind of math that goes into this, I'm going to call them group homomorphisms, because they map from k tuples of integers to lower dimensional tuples of integers. OK. And so my goal is to have communication, lower bounds, and optimal algorithms for any program that, that I can abstract in that particular way, which is a lot of code. OK, so let me tell you what the answer is without trying to prove it. So given any program that looks like that, then there's a magic exponent such that, no matter how you organize that code, is, uh, the number of words moved is lower bounded by the number of iterations, so the cardinality of that set S in the previous slide, divided by M to some magic exponent, the cache size of some magic exponent. So where does the magic exponent come from? It's a linear program. And here is the linear program. I'm going to minimize the sum of all of these other integers subject to these linear constraints. And what are the linear constraints? I take subgroups of k tuples of integers. I take their ranks. You can think of that. That's just like the dimension of a vector space. So there's some integers. And I ask that this, uh, linear, pro this linear inequality be satisfied. And 
I have a whole other talk on the intuition behind this. You know, it, it's basically dimensional analysis that you know that freshman physics students can understand. But you know, this is a deep theorem that includes you know that a lot of pure mathematicians have worked on for centuries, and this is in some sense the most general version of it. So in, yeah, so the, this was, it depends on a recent result in pure mathematics by my collaborator Mike Christ at Berkeley, Terry Tao at UCLA, and some other folks in the UK. And the three famous mathematicians were all this sort of generalization. I mean, this includes Cauchy Schwartz as a special case, Holder's inequality as a special case, but the most general version is called the Holder Brass Camp Leap, HBL. Okay, so that, that's our goal, to hit that lower bound. But the first question is, can we even write it down? That was a very abstract description. And of course, if you're a per pure mathematician, you stop there and declare victory. But as a computer scientist, we actually have to implement it, right? So let's ask if that's possible. So first of all, it looked like I had an infinite number of inequalities because there's one for every subgroup. But it turns out there's still only finitely many inequalities because all of those integers were in a finite range from zero to the number, of, you know, to D, zero to the number of loop indices. So it really is a finite linear program. So the, our first attempt to write down, we asked the question, can we write down all the inequalities? And the bad news is we discovered that it was equivalent to something called Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals. Now, you may have heard of Hilbert's 10th problem over the integers. That was proven undecidable back in the 60s. Uh, then there's Hilbert's 10th problem over the real numbers. That's called Tarski decidable. Um, uh, both Berkeley faculty members who contributed this, by the way, a long time ago. <laughs> and <clears throat> and then there's Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals, which is between the integers. This has been open for 40 years. Nobody knows if it's decidable or not. So that sort of set us back. But then we realized we didn't have to write down all of the inequalities. There was a nice subset of them, which came out of a field of mathematics called lattice theory. And it's decidable, but still could be expensive. And then, and I'm still you know, editing this paper, there are a bunch of special cases where it's really easy to write down the linear program. For example, if you have at most three arrays, it's easy to write down closed form. If you have at most five loop indices, easy to write down. When the subscripts are subs just subsets of indices like i and j and k, you know, it's easy to write down. So there are lots of, you know, we can do this. So now we know we can write down the lower bound. And the next question is, is it attainable? And so we just proved this theorem uh, last November. Yes, it is always attainable. There's an optimal tiling. It can be much more complicated than you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the square m, m to the 1 half by m to the 1 half blocks for, uh, for matrix multiply. But we can always attain it. Now, you probably are saying to me, don't you have some assumptions? OK, yes, we have some assumptions in order to do this. So in particular, we're only doing asymptotic stuff here. So we can attain this in a big O sense. You know, if you add some extra assumptions about what your loops look like, we can actually you know, get the constant right. Um, it also obviously depends on the loop dependencies. So every, you know, if, I, if my code is more complicated than matrix multiply, then I, don't I can't necessarily execute everything in an arbitrary order that may be compatible with my tilings. So for example, in Gaussian elimination, you know, if, I don't, if I do all of those inner loops in an arbitrary order, I'm going to get the wrong answer. right? So, so not every tiling is compatible. So I'm going to have to assume that, in, you know, that either I have no dependencies or there are simple dependencies like reductions or it's compatible. You know, my tiling is compatible. And um, the other assumption is that my tile will fit inside uh, the, uh, the you know, my tile is big enough, so let's say m to the 1 half, it fits inside my loop indices. And so, for example, if I'm doing square matrix multiply, that's easy to do. But suppose I'm doing a matrix times a vector, matrix vector multiply. That's sort of a special case. But in that case, you know, one of my dimensions is 1, and I can't fit my tile in there, and I can't do it. So we've actually, you know, this has come up recently because we've been applying this to convolutional neural nets. And so there's some more special cases to get it to work. And I should say that the way this works is the, all we do is we take the dual of that linear program that I showed you before. So it's, the magic turns out to be the dual of the holder brass camp leap inequality works. So let me just give you some more speed up numbers just to make all this you know, more concrete. So this is speed up on the direct end body algorithm. So I just have two nested loops. I take all pairs of particles, pi and pj, you know, compute some force interaction, and increment the force on, on, on f. And so here, I'm showing you that idea of uh, using extra copies applies in general. 
So what I'm going to do here is say, here's how I'm going to, this is for uh, 8,000 particles, 32,000 particles on 8,000 cores. So this is very compute, uh, uh, communication bound, because each core is only responsible for four particles. And so if I only have one copy of the data, this is how long it takes, and the green is a communication, and it completely dominates the computation. But if I start having extra copies, two copies of the data, four copies, eight copies, the communication drops proportional to C, and I get perfect speedups. And in this case, it's a factor of you know, nearly 12 speedups. So again, by using the same trick that works for this general code. So you may ask, do people actually do direct end body algorithms? I mean, doesn't everybody use the fast multiple method? Well, let me, let me give you some, some examples where this comes up. So if you look at the bottom of the fast multiple method, it is, it is actually doing uh, the, the direct algorithm. And in fact, if you look at the applications of FMM on GPUs, the GPUs are so fast, they do the direct body algorithm you know, for very large problems. So these are all sorts of common applications. Um, I learned about another one from one of my colleagues in electrical engineering. He uses it for electron beam lithography. But the most interesting one I learned about lately is it's used for hair. So one of my colleague, Kathy Yellick's students, spent a summer at Disney, and he was responsible for writing the software to make uh, Princess Merida's hair work well. So when she sort of waves her head around and she has much longer hair than I do, her hair kind of bounces in all these different ways, and they're solving an in-body problem there. So each hair is represented by a bunch of, you know, a string with a bunch of uh, uh, repellent objects on it, and so as it moves around, that's the simulation they do to make it all look realistic. So one of the things that uh, he discovered, unfortunately, by working at Disney, you know, they, they've used this software ever since. This is the standard software for doing, in -body, uh, for doing hair uh, at Disney, is that if you only work uh, for three months, you don't get screen credit, even if they use your tools all the time. So, but it was still a good experience. OK. So ongoing work. We're applying this all to convolutional neural nets. That's you know, seven nested loops. And, but there's lots and lots of special cases because some of the loop bounds are very narrow and some of them are wider. And so there's lots of cases there. Where we've almost got that written up. Um, you know, we're you know, working on algorithms. This is a computational algebra, you know, symbolic algebra for those of you who are interested. You know, so we, we need to do a lot of that in order to derive this, uh, the lower bounds and the optimal algorithms. Um, we're you know, trying to use that extra memory, that trick where we can use C copies of the data, and you know, we're trying to figure out how that generalizes to arbitrary code. And then, of course, the compiler community would like us to deal with dependencies more generally, so we have to figure out how to extend this classical uh, brass camp leap theory to deal with dependencies, and we have some ideas, but that's some hard math. And of course, ultimately, we don't want every programmer to have to you know, know all of this mathematics, just the compiler writers. So <laughs> the goal is to you know, get this incorporated into compilers at some point. OK. So the last topic, finally, is completely different. And so you can flush your caches if you like. And it's, it's a new idea. And it's the Krilov subspace methods. And so these are algorithms which basically, you, know, you can think of them this way. I'm doing k steps of an algorithm uh, to, let's say, solve ax equal b or to solve an eigenvalue problem. Each, inter each of those iterations basically does a sparse matrix vector multiply, an SPMV, with a and some vector that depends on the previous iteration. And there's you know, in a very, very long list of these kinds of methods. So my goal is to uh, minimize communication. And so the easiest way to picture this is to imagine your matrix is well partitioned. So think of a finite element matrix where I know how to break it up into parts where I have very few you know, edge connections with the other parts. I'll draw a picture of that later. So what can we do? So let's think about the serial implementation first. I take k steps of conjugate gradient. I'm going to do k Sparse matrix, vector, sparse matrix vector multiplies. The matrix is too big to fit in cache. Every one of those requires moving the data from uh, slow memory to fast memory. So the bandwidth cost is going to grow by a factor of k, because I have to read the matrix k times. I'm going to move the, the matrix once and take k steps of the algorithm. And one is a lower bound, obviously. That's the, the sequential algorithm. What about the parallel case? So I have my matrix spread over P processors. Each step, I'm going to do a sparse matrix vector multiply and some dot products. And so the conventional algorithm, every time I do a dot product, it has to do a reduction that costs me log P messages among processors. And so to take K steps, K reductions, K log P messages. I'm going to do it all with one reduction. So I'm going to take K steps of the algorithm and only do one reduction. 
So you'll see uh, we'll have lots of speed up possible from this, both modeled and measured. Now the price we're going to pay for this is we're going to do some redundant computation. And so, but computing is cheap, so we're willing to do that. But there's still a bunch of challenges here. Suppose your matrix is not so well partitioned. Um, uh, do, dealing with preconditioning is still a challenge. You know, we have some preconditioners, but you know, doing ones in general is much harder. And uh, you'll see that numerical stability is interesting because the obvious way of reorganizing these algorithms may be numerically unstable, and so we have to explore a space of stable ways to do it. So, but let me show you the main trick for doing K matrix, sparse matrix vector multiplies for the cost of one. And I'll show it to you in a very simple case where I can draw every last detail a tridiagonal matrix, a 32 by 32 tridiagonal matrix A, and what I want to compute with one communication is A times X, A squared times X, dot, 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 up to A to the K times X. So I want to do K sparse matrix vector multiplies at the cost of one, and so each of, <coughs> each of these dots represents the 32 entries of X, those dots are A times X and so forth. So since my matrix is tridiagonal, I can draw all the dependencies. So to compute that entry of A times X, I need three entries of X, those particular three. And to keep the uh, PowerPoint a little simpler, let me just color in the triangle. So everything at the tip of the triangle depends on all the data at the base. And this picture, of course, repeats itself everywhere. So to compute that particular entry of A cubed X, I need those three entries of A squared X. And if I continue the dependent, drawing the dependencies down, I eventually need all those entries of X. Okay? So that's what I need to compute a cube, that one entry of a cube, but of course I want to compute a whole lot. So suppose I want to compute all those entries, I eventually need everything at the base of the triangle. So that's the dependency graph, very simple. So now, let me try to implement this, and suppose that my cache is only big enough to hold about a quarter of the data at a time. So what am I going to do? I'm going to read in the first quarter of the entries of X, the first quarter of the rows of A, and I have enough data now to compute everything in that uh, blue trapezoid. That's the first step. Then I read in the next quarter of the entries of X and rows of A, but I also have to keep kind of a ghost zone, so I need to keep those four numbers and those four numbers. Then I have everything that I need to compute everything in that uh, red parallelogram. Then I can compute the blue parallelogram, and then I compute the, the yellow trapezoid. And I've only r read the data once and written the data once. Uh, so it's very simple, each, okay, so that's the sequential algorithm. Now let me do the parallel case, again for this tridiagonal. Suppose I have four processors, and I want each processor to be responsible for computing everything, you know, in this one quarter of all those entries. And so if, I am, if I'm responsible for all those from the same picture as before, I need everything at the base. So what would the traditional algorithm do? It would have send one message to send that to there. It would have a second message to send that number up there. And a third message to send that number from there. So it would take me three messages to do this. I want to do it with one message. I think it's pretty easy to see what I'm going to do. I'm going to take those three numbers, package them into one message, and then send them just in one message to processor 2 from processor 1. And processor three will similarly take all those, package them up, and send them there. So that's one message. And then I can compute, I have all the data I need to compute everything in the red uh, trapezoid. So now every processor is going to do that. And so here is the dependency for everything. And you can see I'm being redundant. Everything in those overlapping regions at the end are going to be computed twice. But that is an asymptotically smaller chunk of data, so I'm willing to do that. So that says I can compute all of these, you know, a, a squared, A cubed with one uh, set of messages. So that is the tridiagonal case, and, but it works for arbitrary graphs. So let me just draw a picture of what it would look like for an arbitrary sparse matrix. So here, this picture, each vertex represents a row and column of a symmetric matrix. Each edge represents a non-zero entry. And I've partitioned it across processors, so each dotted line represents you know, processor one owns that, processor two owns that. And so what I'd like to do is use the same idea I had in the previous slide to do one communication with all my neighbors. So what do I need to do A times X? I, you know, what do I depend on? I basically look, follow one edge out. I do one step of breadth first search and I say, hey, I need all the red ones. That's enough for A times X. Go out one more edge, follow two edges out. I need all the green ones to do A squared. Follow one more edge out. I need, I'm three edges out. I need all of those to do A cubed. 
So what am I going to do? I'm going to pack, package up all the red, the green, and the blue into one message and send it from that processor to that processor. So it's exactly the same thing as I did before. And so now, instead of that simple partitioning I did about tridiagonal matrix, you know, just block rows, I have to do graph partitioning or more generally something called hypergraph partitioning in order to minimize the number of edge uh, cuts. And the thing I did before about, you know, when I did the sequential algorithm uh, back here, I just went from, you know, left to right. I have to, uh, I, that, you know, there is no left to right in a, in a matrix like this. It turns into the traveling salesman problem. So that turns out to be the right way to formulate that. And again, I only need to solve it approximately in order to, do the, to optimize that. And so all these ideas work. So let me, so that is enough, uh, I'm getting close to the end, to uh, compute a basis for the Krilov subspace. But it's not the same basis that the standard algorithm computes, right? So I have to change the rest of the algorithm so I can still get the right answer. And so let me just sketch this for GM res. So here's the classical GM res. I do one matrix vector multiply. I do modified Gram-Schmidt to make that vector orthogonal to all the ones I had before. And then I update a little, you know, K by K Hessenberg matrix of all of the coefficients. And when I'm done, I solve a little K by K least squares problem. So here's the new algorithm. I compute a different basis for the same uh, Krilov subspace, the way I just showed you. I still need an orthogonal basis for it, so I'm going to use tall skinny QR, that algorithm I told you about before. And that's going to give me basically these vectors that I had before, these, you know, the Vs. Then I need to change the algebra, and I can still build that little k by k upper Hessenberg matrix from this R factor. And then I can solve the least squares problem with H. And in the sequential case, this hits the lower bound. The number of words moved decreases by a factor of k. In the parallel case, the number of messages decreases by a factor of k. Sounds good, but there's a terrible numerical bug in this code. Does anybody see what the bug is? Everything is true in exact arithmetic. It's a floating point problem. I'm running the power method. All of these vectors are converging to the dominant eigenvector. They're getting more and more nearly parallel. They're a terrible basis for the Krilov subspace. But let me just try running it anyway, see what happens. So, so here's a convergence plot of classical GM res. And so uh, residual on a log scale versus iteration count, it's converging nicely. Let me run the algorithm on the previous slide. There's the convergence plot. I guess you could call it a convergence plot. So, but but the thing is that I have a choice. I don't just have to compute AX, A squared X, A cubed X. I can choose other polynomials. So let me choose the polynomials cleverly, something called a Newton basis. And I can make them nice and numerically independent, and I get all the speed ups I wanted, and I get convergence. OK, so that, so that requires some numerical analysis to pick the right polynomial basis. So let me show you some speed up numbers. So this is for lots of different you know, matrices from some matrix market, some place like that. Uh, it's normalized to the time for the fast algorithm. So, with, uh, so that's one. And the higher bar is the classical GM res, how many times slower it is. So here, it's 2.3 times better to do it the new way. 2.1, 1.7, 4.3. 1 the color bar is, say, where the time, how the time changed. And it turns out that both the it was important to both change, optimize the sparse linear algebra and the dense linear algebra. So here, for example, uh, the modified Gram-Schmidt shrank from this purple down to the uh, tall skinny QR and block Gram-Schmidt. So there was a, here most of the speed up was from doing the dense linear algebra better. And here, the speed up was going from the sparse matrix vector multiplied, you know, the, the classical way to using that uh, new kernel I just showed you. So depending on your problem, it could be either the dense linear algebra or the sparse linear algebra. So when we first started doing this work, I had one student tuning the dense linear algebra, another student turn, turning the sparse linear algebra. They put it all together, and it slowed down dramatically. It was terrible. And what we realized is that the two independently optimized kernels, dense and sparse, were fighting one another over the cache. And so what we had to do, uh, do to go back was we had to co-tune the kernels. So they knew they were going to share it with one another. And then we got these speed ups. So what that means is it's no longer possible to have independently tuned dense and sparse linear algebra libraries, put them together, and hope for the best. It all has to be co-tuned. So, so this was a simple algorithm we did first. Let me just give you some eye candy for uh, bike CG stab. So this is a very uh, classical algorithm. It's not meant to be readable. So this is the, you know, the nine lines of code that the usual algorithm does. Here's the communication avoiding version of it. Uh, it took a lot more algebra to do. <laughs> And these um, 
two matrix uh, multiplies turned into these three calls to that kernel is what was required. And these uh, various dot products turned into a matrix matrix multiply of a matrix times its transpose, which went very, very fast. And uh, without going into details, this gave us a 4.3 speed up, 4.2 speed up for the bottom solver in this uh, geometric multigrid benchmark. And it gave up uh, in the overall, uh, so you wouldn't think a bottom solver was the bottleneck in, in geometric multigrid, but it actually is when you have enough processors. Um, and, and the overall uh, GMG benchmark sped up by a factor of 2.5. Okay, so I'm in the summary part now. So we have new lower bounds, optimal algorithms, and big speed ups for iterative linear algebra. There's lots of other work to do. So uh, I, I told you about BICG, STAB, and GMRES. There's a long list of other algorithms. Many of them have been optimized. There's still some to do. It extends to machine learning. So um, if you can apply these same ideas to coordinate descent for lasso, which is, of course, nonlinear, but all the same ideas apply. Um, you know, it's still a bit of an art to create the stable versions. You know, pick a Newton basis, you know, with what are the parameters in the Newton basis, but, you know, so that work could be done. Um, for preconditioning, there's an idea from Mike Carew for doing underlapping domain decomposition that seems to work. And if you have hierarchical semi-separable matrices, some of you probably know what those are. It works for those too, but the general case is, is quite difficult. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of sparse matrices, not just explicitly stored sparse matrices. There's stencils, there's all sorts of things, and the ideas have to be applied differently. So, uh, I guess I'm over time, so I won't tell you about these two related topics. One of them was that uh, we have to follow hardware trends, and one of the hardware trends is that writes can be much more expensive than reads, like on flash memory. And so we can extend all the theory to independently lower bound the number of writes to slow memory and the number of reads. And we get different algorithms, again. I mean, variations of the existing ones if you want to minimize the number of writes to the slow memory. And we've also been involved in two different uh, standards committees. The BLAS Standards Committee is meeting again, and the IEEE Floating Point Standards Committee is meeting again to introduce some new instructions and new algorithms that will let us run all these algorithms reproducibly, no matter what order you execute all the dot products in. So floating point is not addition is not associative, but people want to get the same answer, and we've figured out ways to do that. So, let me say, there's a lot of details I skipped. There's a, uh, a survey article we wrote for ACT in America just in the linear algebra part a few years ago. Um, we have an online course um, that's offered every spring. It'll be broadcast. You can look at the, uh, the uh, YouTube videos of the old ones if you like. And it's offered as a SPOC, a small personalized online course by NSF, so you can, you can get credit at your local university for doing This is parallel computing in general, and communication avoiding algorithms are one. This is joint work with a lot of people, and um, I saved their names for this slide. So let me just highlight some of the, the current local students, in particular uh, my colleague Kathy Yellick, with whom I collaborate very closely both on avoiding communication and raising two children. Now that sounds like a contradiction, but you just have to be careful what communication you avoid. So, <laughs> so, and then there's just lots of other people, former students, collaborators at other universities, and thank you to all the funding agencies, etc. So, to summarize, it's time to re redesign all linear algebra, n-body algorithms and software, redo the compilers, and what it all has in common is don't communicate. <laughs> So questions from the audience? Yeah, Steve? So, so the, the question of the basis. Oh, we're going to pass the mic. Uh, so for the issue of the, the basis of the, um, the uh, like Newton basis yeah, versus the you Newton know. basis versus the standard basis. It seems like the optimal basis would be the one where you already know the the, the spectrum. Is yes, that, is that correct? Right, and so and yes, and so the the trick there is to bootstrap. And so since you're running a Krilov subspace method, you can build approximations for the eigenvalues as you go along. And as you learn more and more more about the eigenvalues, you can improve your Newton basis. Yeah, so that that's one trick. Okay, other questions? Over here. 
Yeah. I think it's a follow up to that. There was a you, how, uh, there was a there was a K there was a K in that in the how far you extended the Krilov basis and computed the new right. data. Right. That's uh, a tuning parameter. Yeah. I mean, and, what, and what so sort of let me range is that in? So so for this particular example, uh, K went up to you know from four, five, fifteen. Uh, we've had different experiences with with different uh, you know problems. So for example, in the by CG stab example, it turned out that all of these speed ups. Uh, we didn't change the entire geometric multigrid code. We were just changing, which, which was the A times X part of it. We were only changing, if you like, the dense linear algebra part, the dot products and so forth. And so uh, in that case, you know, we were only limited by you know, what, you know, the dense linear algebra because we didn't change the sparse linear algebra and we still got those speed ups. And, and so if K only grows to five, then maybe we don't have to worry. And does the theory say anything about how far you can take t k with respect to when it becomes unstable to do so? Um, uh, it's all empirical at this point. So, so well, okay. So we have we have a, you know many long papers uh, where we've done extensive uh, error analysis of all of this too. So, so for example, Chris Page, you know, has some classical analysis of the Lanchos method of its stability and convergence, and, and, and those are famous papers. And so here's the common feature when you extend it to do it our way, there's a, um, all of the error bounds uh, include now a factor which is the condition number of the basis. So, you know, so that appears as a linear factor, perhaps not surprisingly, but it's like 20 pages of algebra. I'm, uh, you're welcome to read it. Uh, and I'll, I'll blame my graduate student, Erin Carson. She did all the work on that. So, yes. Yeah, so. Okay, Sammy. So Uh, I have a question uh, on the second part of your talk. So for this theorem that said um, for a given set of four loops. Right, which don't have to be four loops. Let me just get back to that slide. Right, all that we uh, care about is that we can so extract our code so that we're iterating over some subset of k tuples of integers in some arbitrary order, could be dense or sparse. Okay. So for loops may not be the most natural way to express it. That I'm accessing a bunch of locations in memory uh, which are determined uniquely. It doesn't mean that's the memory address. It just means that you could have inter indirection determined uniquely by these linear-ish operators. And then there's a way to structure that program that's an arbitrary program in that format. Right. That, so first there is this lower bound right. that says for this right. uh, way of accessing right. the data in the memory, there's a lower bound on the amount of communication that has to happen. Yes. That is expressible. Right. Moreover, there's a tiling you said. That the right. one theorem is that there's a tiling. Is that yes. easy and to find? Like is that, is so, or, or is it just an existence? No, no, no. We, we, ha we actually have Mathematica code that... Uh, that computes it. So for an arbitrary code, you could find the optimal tiling yes, but and then restructure the program. Yes, yes. So, so we have code that, uh, you know, it's not, you know, implemented in the compiler, but if you give me the groups which come from this analysis here, you know, then uh, what we can do is um, take those groups. We have to do, you know, some iterative stuff on it. We have to do a um, various matrix decompositions on the bases of those groups, and then we can produce a tiling. I have some really cool pictures uh, that I could show you on another PowerPoint slide uh, if, if you want. So, but maybe, yeah. So, yeah, but, but the, the tilings can be, if you like, okay, so n body. So the, the, the simplest tiling is just a little square of size m by m. So let's suppose I change my subscripts to be instead of i and j, i and i plus j. It turns into a parallelogram. Then if I change into arbitrary subscripts, I get a parallelogram with gaps. You know, so it, it takes every other point in that direction, every other point in that direction. But I also, it turns out, have to do shifts on them. And that turns out to be, and the number of shifts is, turns out to be correspond to a torsion of a particular group that appears in a certain group decomposition. Yeah, so there's, all of that is you know, written down carefully. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Do we have more uh, questions? Yes. So on, on the same slide that he was asking about, you're, you're just accessing a deterministically chosen array in memory. So say you have an algorithm where it mostly falls into this case, but then maybe you have to maintain some priority queue or you have to look up in like a hash table. Mm -hmm. Do you still get a lot of speed ups by applying these ideas just with the little extra piece? 
So, so, so for example, I have this like pointer, which could be some arbitrary data structure that gives you, you know, you look up in memory it, and it finally returns the data. All I care about is that there's a linear mapping from, you know, you know, some some index to some location in memory, you know, which could be in some complicated data structure. You need that piece of data, and so, uh, you know, if so what I'm going to do is minimize the number of passes through that data structure, if you like, to, to get that data. So, so what, I mean, what's an example of a data structure that, where this does not help? Um, so you're, you're saying it's even better than I thought. That, that, that's possible. I mean, um, so, uh, so the question is, are there uh, ways of doing this indexing where, uh, you know, you, you don't use arbitrary you know, affine functions in order to, you know, point to something. Um, I mean, you're saying this is very, yeah. very general, but what's, yeah. what's the case where it's not helping you? Right. So, so in scientific computing, which is where most of my examples come from, this is why, you know, I'm motivated by this, because most of the time you're accessing arrays. And so, so another example, which I was talking about this morning in, in your office, was uh, uh, database joins. And, and so there the question, I think, is more open as to whether, you know, all of the... Con and it, the simplest way you can think of a database join, I mean, people have much better algorithms, it's the n-body problem. I, I do all, take all pairs of, of items in the database and I compare them and I keep them if, if they join. But obviously people do some things that are much more clever than that with hash tables and with, you know, sorting and merge sorts on, on, on index lists. And so I'd say that's open as to whether that maps to this. Another example, let me, let me just be concrete, is Strassen. So we, we proved all these lower bounds for Strassen, uh, but they use completely different mathematics. Uh, and I, I, I have more slides than that that I didn't get to because I already ran over. And so the Strassen lower bound, it's not n cubed over m to the 1 half, it's n to the omega, where n could, you know, omega is your magic exponent. And, and it does not just Strassen, it could be any Strassen-like algorithm. So. And then the denominator, it's not m to the 1 half, it's, let me get this right, it's n to the um, uh, magical exponent over 2. So, so and, and that requires a different gr uh, group theory, a graph theoretic kind of analysis of, of that one. So the, the, it extends, but not using this particular analysis. So thank you. Um, so uh, looks like it, so uh, we're happy. Uh, so let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.